Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our panel discussion today. Uh, my name is Tegan Davies, and I'm the General Manager of the Oranges Toolkit, and I'm thrilled to bring you an incredible panel of speakers across different industries who are here to speak about building well and happy teams. And uh, it's a recognition of a really important month here uh, in Australia and worldwide around uh, Mental Health Month. So thanks for dialing in. I see a few people who have already mentioned where they're from in the chat. We'd love this to be a really engaging session. So feel free to introduce yourselves in the chat function, remembering to press all panelists and attendees so everyone can see your wonderful comments. Uh, as with any program at the Oranges Toolkit, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we all meet on today. For me, that's the Rwandari people of the Kulin Nation, and I'd love to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. So a little bit of housekeeping today. Um, hopefully you've actually seen how to press chat. Um, if you do have any problems at all, there is a guy in the panelist function that you'll be able to see. Uh, actually, I think it's under Orange's toolkit today. Um, John is there manning it behind the scenes. So if you have any tech issues, please message him directly uh, and he'll be able to support you through it. Uh, we'd love you to actually ask questions too. So if you have any questions of the panelists, there'll be a, a Q&A session later on in this, in this segment. So please feel free to um, add your questions that you may have and we'll try to get as many questions answered as possible. Um, so without further ado, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the Oranges Toolkit because I know we have um, some returning customers and clients here. There's some really beautiful familiar names that I'm seeing already. And also uh, there's some newcomers to our community. And so for those who don't know, the Oranges Toolkit has quite a unique story actually. Um, we were actually born at Camp Quality and uh, Camp Quality, for those who also don't know, is the, the leading childhood cancer charity in Australia. Uh, I've had the privilege of being involved with the organisation since I was 19, so we're talking a few years now, and I've seen firsthand the amazing impact that the Camp Quality volunteers and staff have on families who are going through a really difficult time. And if you've never worked in childhood cancer, you, you don't necessarily have to know that it could probably be a pretty emotive workplace. There are times where staff and volunteers are challenged really emotionally around diagnoses of families who they know um, and who they develop really strong relationships with. So a number of years ago, the Orange, sorry, Camp Quality, got a bit excited about the Oranges Toolkit then, uh, Camp Quality designed a two-day wellbeing program to build the wellbeing literacy of staff and volunteers so that they can be more resilient, they can be more optimistic, and they can manage the day-to-day -day stresses more effectively and more productively. And uh, the program was so successful that we started to deliver the program to corporate sponsors uh, to say thank you for donating money. And quite quickly, corporate sponsors started to pay for it. And our capacity internally at Camp Quality to deliver that program to corporates was actually outstripped pretty quickly. So in 2017, born was the Oranges Toolkit, a separate social enterprise that is social trader certified, which is fantastic. Um, that really all of our profits go to support children living with cancer. And today in lieu of I don't, uh, a price for the ticket, if you have some spare change, we'd love you to be able to donate to Camp Quality and we'll provide a link uh, later on if you're in a position to. Um, so I get to now introduce your wonderful speakers. And I'm absolutely thrilled that um, Deborah and Gary and Martin can donate their time today. Um, so Deborah is the CEO of Camp Quality and she may look a little familiar to you. Um, Deborah has been in the public eye for many years um, and uh, particularly spent uh, nine years as um, the chief uh, of edit, the chief editor, rather, of Australian Women's Weekly. And Deborah, thank you, because I have many, and my mum's actually on the line today, many a birthday cake from the Australian Women's Weekly. So you have brought well-being to my life as a child. <laughs> so thank you for coming in. And Deborah has a, a huge amount of experience um, in the executive space, um, both in the profit sector and the not-for-profit sector. Um, so thanks for joining today. And then we have the wonderful Gary Edstein, uh, the CEO and Senior Vice President of DHL Oceania. Hello, Gary. How are you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm not too sure about the wonderful, but uh, not good to be here. <laughs> well, you're very esteemed, Gary. And Gary has actually <laughs> spent 
40 years in the transport industry. And uh, for those who don't know too much about um, DHL, they have been consistently voted one of the great places to work in Australia and worldwide. Um, I see new DHL announcements popping up all around the world around how great a place DHL is to work. So I'm really thrilled that he's um, here today. And in 2016, he was named a Transport Executive of the Year. So um, thank you again for donating your time for us today. And Good then to last, last. Martin Campbell from Safe Work SA, the, the safety regulator in, in South Australia. Um, Martin's had a pretty colourful career and spent many, time, many years overseas and I think <clears throat> has a master's in almost everything. Um, so thanks for joining us today, Martin. Um, and along with being the executive director of Safe Work SA, I need to read this out because there's some big titles here. There is the Chair of Heads for WorkSafe Authorities and the Advisory Member of the University of South Australia Centre of Workplace Ex Excellence, just because he's, he's not busy enough. Um, so thank you, Martin, for joining us as well. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So um, I'd love to actually open up the conversation. So uh, if you have any questions of the panellists as we go along, please do ask. Um, but I'd actually like to start with Martin. Um, given the fact that Safe Work SA is the safety regulator in, in South Australia, I'm sure you've got um, an interesting perspective and some statistics or understanding around why it is so important to build mentally healthy teams. And I'm curious to hear from you. Not a problem. So I think from, from my perspective, um, I originally came from a practitioner from industry yeah, before I became a regulator. So um, I sort of see it through both, both lenses in many regards. And what I've seen over the years is, is a real focus on the physical injury and illness that OHS presents. So people are really conscious and always try to stop fingers being chopped off and legs and that sort of thing. But there's been a bit of a void over many years in relation to psychosocial and psychological illness. And that's really just I think is very and a very emerging area. So, what I've looked at some at some sort of complaints statistics from South Australia over the last five years, and and what we've seen is around about three thousand six hundred uh, workers' compensation claims for psychological illness. Now, and the average cost of those claims around about $53,000 a claim. And, and the majority of those are for non-serious and the serious claims are certainly getting into the six figures. And, and then when we drill down into the sort of industries that you see those claims presenters, um, the vast majority are twice the rate of any other industry is healthcare and, and social assistance closely followed by the education sector. So these are workplace stress, bullying, um, psychological, um, psychiatric um, illnesses presented through the workplace. So, so we're seeing a steady, a, a steady presentation of those sort of claims. Um, but what we find in industry is that people um, don't necessarily focus on the mental health side of work health and safety. Um, and we've been drilling for the last three years that I've been at Safe Work, um, drilling this area to try and get organisations to step up. Um, we, we find a huge um, continuum of quality. Some people have nothing at all in place, don't even consider it an issue, um, right the way to gold standard, and it's part of the fabric of an organisation, which is fantastic. Um, so what we've tried to do is, is push the psychological risk as a real part of work health and safety, as along with the don't hurt people and chop the fingers and legs off. So, so w when I came into Safe Work three years ago, there was a, a number of challenges that presented to me. Um, we'd had a number of reviews to say that we weren't particularly very good at what we were doing, and we embarked on a, a change program. The change program very became an organisational reform program and was. Uh, required us to have some significant changes, changes that the organization had never seen in 20, 25 years. And, um, and people's well-being was a real factor in my planning in how we were going to implement that change strategy. And, um, and that's where we engaged Oranges. And I think we've, we've been running with the Oranges Toolkit program now um, for the last three years or two and a half years. We've integrated it as part of our onboarding process. It's an opportunity that we 
uh, give our workers, our staff, to draw on tools to help them, initially help them through the, the change reform program, but now it's about part of our well-being. Um, so we, we do have a well-being committee. Um, we have introduced a number of initiatives to try and maintain mental health and mental well-being in the workplace, um, including with the first South Australian government department that brings your dog to work. Um, so we, we have dogs running around the office. I've got a desk full of schmackos and some of them have <laughs> got a desk full of schmackos. And it's not uncommon to have retrievers and bulldogs walking in um, half part way through meetings. Um, we've got desktop yoga. We've got other initiatives. We've got a, um, an office Olympics um, where we compete around the office doing different things. And, and that's been fantastic. But then COVID kicked in and it sort of made us think a little bit differently how we keep to engage our staff. So. So for me, it was sort of really twofold. One is about um, getting awareness about psychological risks and illness across the industry in South Australia. Um, and the other part of it is actually integrating well-being throughout our organisation so that we're um, walking the talk. Uh, so, I mean, and, and I'd be really interested, Deborah, from your views on how sort of camp quality has sort of implemented some of those strategies as well. I think... Um, I think um, Martin, you're absolutely right when you call, call Deborah, wrong with my sound. Yeah, a bit of feedback there. Not sure what that is. Is that better? Mm, go again. Okay, how's that? Still no, a bit of feedback. feedback. Have you got two, um, two sound systems on by any chance? Uh, shouldn't have, but um, I'm just wondering. Please. Can you, you hear me now? Coming through okay to me, Deborah. Yeah. Is it all right now? Yeah, yeah it's I'll working now. Okay, apologies for that. Um, no, mental health is absolutely um, at the forefront, particularly now during this COVID pandemic. And like all businesses, I think that um, some, it's something we've never seen before. I mean, we've seen stress and anxiety in the workforce, but we've now got people working for us where the stress and anxiety is throughout your entire life. The uncertainty, the negativity, the financial stress, not just of um, the organizations that we work for, but also individuals. We're seeing our friends out of work. We're seeing people who um, are close to us potentially losing their business. All of these things are at play outside of the work space, but then also at play in the workplace. And so certainly that psychological well-being is absolutely uh, top of mind, I would say, for any um, executive and any leader, line leader with, throughout a business. I think that in with camp quality, where we're lucky in some ways is that there's a very clear sense of purpose for people who work in the not-for-profit sector. And that's giving you some optimism, some resilience, um, because people have a, understand why they're there. And they also see that we're dealing with people who are perhaps in much more difficult circumstances than anybody who's working um, in the organisation. And that is families with children um, diagnosed with cancer. So there's always been a kind of culture and a way of looking for positivity and resilience. And thank you to Oranges has been a big part of helping our people through that. But that said, I think that the sense of disconnection that a lot of people are finding sometimes working from home or not being able to do what they normally do is a big problem. So for us at Camp Quality, 65% of our revenue, for example, came from events. Well, we've cancelled all of those events. So I've got a lot of people whose jobs are purely events sitting around thinking, well, have I got a job for the future? What am I doing? All of the things that I put in place in the first, the last six months have now had to be cancelled or rescheduled. And that's a difficult thing for, for, for people to, to deal with. Then we've also got our services and programs and 70% of those are face to face. So we've got a lot of staff with an absolute passion for what they do, not being able to necessarily do what they're, 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 they're not supposed to do, but what they um, signed up to do. So as an organisation, this um, we've had to look at how we do things. So a big part of what we've been doing is looking at how we engage with our kids and families from a digital perspective. And the great upside of that is all of a sudden I've got a workforce who's collaborating in a different way. We've got all of these new projects. We've got 
the ultimately the same aim, which is to to be able to um, provide laughter, fun, and information and and um, education to uh, to the to our kids and families. But we've got kid people collaborating. People are suddenly doing um, presenting online. They're creating videos. They're doing virtual camps. We've got digital um, play play dates with the puppets for the kids in isolation in hospitals. So we've had to adapt very quickly and there's been rapid change. But the best thing to have come out of that is this collaboration. But also, and again, I'm not probably speaking as a singular organisation, there, there is uncertainty with a rapid amount of change. So the uncertainty, again, of the COVID and all of the external factors, coupled with the uncertainty of where a business is going when the change is so great, great and you may not have had enough time to prepare people for it, is a challenge for all leaders. So how do we get around that? Um, some of the things, um, well, one of the most important things is communication and really communicating with people on a regular basis. With uncertainty, people want to know facts and they want to know those facts um, as soon as they, they come to hand. So we have regular communications once a week with the leadership team. Anybody can Zoom anytime that they want to. We have um, town halls with, with all of the staff. We also have a special thing here at um, Camp Quality that we call Fun Therapy. And fun therapy is something where we start every meeting with um, something that's going to uh, bring the mood up or take the mood down. It was something that was learned on the camps, but the idea is to break the ice and to put every, a positive spin on the meeting by having this, this, opening, um, this opening sort of question, answer or joke or whatever someone might want to do. We also have a pulse check that goes out once a week to all of our staff where staff can be anonymous in telling us the things that might concern them, but we're able to sort of monitor staff. And that's uh, a thing that we have done through a company called Local Measure who have developed that for us. It's very simple. It's an emoji, but it allows us to keep track of people, how they're feeling, because sometimes people won't tell you. They won't tell you on a Zoom session, but they'll tell you in, as, a, as a text message, and then we can ring, back, ring up and get back to those people. So we're pretty one-on-one. -on -one. Communication, the pulse check, and just making sure that staff look out for other staff. And that's really important. So that if you do see someone, and I'd say that probably one of the challenges, and again, not alone, is a lot of people, I tell people, pick up the phone and ring people. I think it's really important to have one-on-one -on -one conversations at the moment. You know what it's like. You get an email from someone, they've sent it in haste. You're in a certain mood, you take it the wrong way. Then all of a sudden, there's a whole sort of emotive thing that starts up. So with people just picking up the phone and talking to people, because how you're feeling, as I say, and what you bring to work may not be a result of work, but unfortunately, if there's miscommunications through, um, uh, through emails, etc., that's going to cause problems. So I guess coming back to it, it's really about communication. It's about looking out for people. It's about listening for people. And it's about addressing the issues as they happen and making sure, as you said, um, Martin, that the physical um, well-being is important absolutely and the mental well-being is matched in terms of focus for um, anybody in a particular any position really it's really the responsibility of every single person within the organization to look out for the others in the organization but uh, Gary you're you're um, you've got a lot more people than I've got uh, over at DHL yeah, thanks, uh, Deborah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be, I think, a little bit repetitive on some of the, um, the points that you've, uh, you've raised. But I just want to talk about uh, the culture and the purpose aspect and the journey that um, DHL's been on for the last 10 years. Um, we, we had this strategy um, from good to great, and the big focus was on motivated people and as Tegan highlighted, uh, you know, we, uh, we were awarded fifth place as uh, a great place to work in Australia. And I think globally, we, we were uh, awarded about uh, fourth, I think, in the world, a great, great place to work. And our employee engagement uh, has been up around the high 80s for, uh, for many years. <clears throat> so the, the culture of, uh, of DHL, you know, I've been with DHL for 34 years. 
Um, and the reason why I stay is because of the culture. Uh, it's, it's a real family culture. It's got those family uh, values uh, of caring. Um, and I'll segue into this with, with respect to what, uh, with health um, and mental health. Um, and on this journey from, from good to, to great, we were very much a results-oriented uh, business for many, many years, had a good culture, but we, we needed to get better at respect. So we've been on this journey uh, with um, results behaviour without compromising on respect behaviour. So that's a, a big um, focus uh, within, within DHL. And our employee engagement uh, reflects that um, it's incredibly respectful, um, in incredibly um, caring. And when you look at the longevity of our staff, um, I was just doing a number of my direct reports. Um, uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the, the average is well over um, 20, 20 years. Um, it, of service. So I've got about 250 years within my direct report. So that's just an indication that people do want to stay in this organisation. As, as Martin said, um, traditionally we, we, we focused when it came to health on the physical aspect uh, and it was all about um, safety. But over the last you know, several years, we've actually um, really focused on the other parts of health which is the emotional health, um, the personal health, and, and also the, the mental health. And we've incorporated a lot of programs, um, wellbeing programs um, into our business. And we're very mindful that um, you know, this mental health issue is becoming a big issue. And uh, I, I look back at the, um, the compensation claims that we've had over the last uh, three or four years. I did this before um, this particular um, um, webinar, and we, we are we are seeing an increase in mental health claims. Now, I, I I wasn't aware of this until I researched it again. But yes, there's there's been you know three or four uh, mental health claims recently. So that's it's on the increase. Um, so you know we've been, we've um, obviously introduced um, programs like um, employee assistance programs, and one of the other initiatives that we've done just recently, and I just wanted to highlight this to you is. Um, we, we reached out to um, our staff who wanted to become more involved um, in the employee assistance program. And we now have EAP ambassadors right through our business. So these EAP ambassadors are staff. Um, we told all our 200, sorry, 2,000 employees here in Australia that if they've got an issue, if they need to talk to someone, um, we've got trained um, ambassadors uh, with respect to um, assistance that they can reach out to. So I think that's a, um, a, a real, for me, um, benefit that we're providing um, our staff. The other thing I wanted to, to just talk about was purpose. And I, I believe strongly that everyone needs a purpose, not just in business, but also um, in just general, general life. And the one thing that we really, um, again, focus on here here in, in DHL is the is the purpose. What why 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 does DHL exist? You know what's our what's our purpose? And our purpose is connecting people and improving lives and trying to make this world a, a better place. And we tell everyone in our organisation that they do have a role to play um, in in the purpose of um, of our organisation. And I think uh, you really need to have a um, a purpose in life, um, being you know as you. Um, go through um, all the chapters of life that you have, you need to reinvent yourself, recreate yourself and, and have a, um, a purpose. Now that COVID's hit, um, the future of work has changed. Uh, we're obviously reviewing um, how we're connecting with our people. 50% of our staff now work from home. We've, start to, we've started to uh, put together a flexible workplace practice um, we're encouraging, you know, our staff to return back to the office safely, but we're, we're not saying right now that it's, there's a strict policy of getting back into um, the office. But as Deborah said, uh, it's important that you, we, you keep on communicating. And we have this little program called Chat and Connect. So um, we reach out regularly to all our staff um, that, you know, are isolated to a certain extent. 
and we want to make sure that um, we're still connecting with them and we're communicating with them. So uh, the the new norm is it's it's definitely a changing world uh, with this COVID pandemic. Um, we're still learning, um, but uh, we're going to embrace it, and we want to make sure that um, we have a a really strong you know work life balance that people um, are comfortable with. And yeah, big focus obviously on this mental health program. So that's that's just a summary of um, you know what we're doing as a as a corporate. And I'll just pass back to Tegan. Thanks, Gary. I'm actually curious, Gary, considering you've been with DHL for many years and you've probably had a bit of a leadership journey yourself, what are the, the biggest strategies you use to help you basically be the role model you want to for your staff? I, I, I think I, I fall back on family a lot. Um, you know, I, I have a, uh, um, a fantastic um, um, family. Uh, uh, they, you know, if you've got, you know, um, a, a strong environment there, then it, it makes life quite, um, quite easy to, uh, to continue with, um, with your corporate life. Yeah. Uh, you've got to be, you've got to be, I think the, the other point, and we've got a couple of programs called Fit to Lead and Fit to Work. And with the Fit to Lead aspect is, you know, you've got to have that, not just the, the physical health, but the mental health, the spiritual health. And the financial health as well. So it's all those all those combinations. And you know, a big one is obviously making sure that um, you're physically well to be able to um, carry out your work. It's actually interesting. I did see a question come through, so I think this might be a perfect opportunity to actually ask this to you, Gary. And um, there was a question around um, training people on financial well-being. Um, is is that an aspect at DHL? Is that important to you? And how, how do you best support your staff, particularly during uncertainty when a lot of people are unsure about job security? Well, we do, we do have um, formal programs like finance for, for non-financial managers. <laughs> uh, but no, when it comes to um, financial, your, your personal finances, we, we do have um, programs um, through EAP. And we, uh, we promote these to all our staff if they want to understand more about um, planning for the future financially, you know, superannuation, um, planning, et cetera. So we, uh, we provide all those types of services to our, our staff. And we get professionals in to, do, to conduct those, those programs. What, you don't run it yourself, Gary? No, no, I'm not very good with numbers. <laughs> Except for the numbers of, of how long your staff have been with you. That's actually incredible. Incredible. I haven't heard of that kind of tenure in any, actually any of our other clients that we work with. So clearly you're doing something right there, Gary. Um, yeah, thank you very much. So Martin, I'm kind of curious around what you've heard from Deborah and Gary and, and are there any other kind of nuggets of wisdom that you'd like to instill on those who might be emerging leaders on this call and how they might be able to lead with wellbeing in mind? Oh, look, I, um, I think the fact that people are on this call is a fantastic step in the right direction. Um, it shows that people are interested and it's on everyone's radar. I, I'm looking at the comments and questions that are coming through. There's a couple of good ones um, from Kim Jacobs. Thank you, Kim, for sending us through. But uh, one of them was about how you engage people back into the workplace during COVID. And I think Deborah and, and Gary have both touched on this, but we, we've gone through a similar process to everyone else. And it's about really um, clear often communications and consult your staff to make sure that um, that they feel part of the decision making process. So we we are in the same position as everyone else where um, we've really got a new opportunity as to what work looks like. So um, a lot of the staff in my organisation have been there for a long time and for a certain generation, um, those of us who are over 50 generally have come from a, a, an era where you leave your home to go somewhere else to work and when you're finished you return back to your home. Those days have gone. Um, really, this is a, a, a really new era in what workplace um, and work is going to be like. So, um, so we're all struggling with it. Um, we've gone through a process of engaging our staff to find out who wants to come nine to five Monday to Friday. And there's a few people that do because working from home is isolating and it's not for them. We've got a, a, a group of individuals who don't want to come in the office at all and, um, and they want to work from home. 
Um, but what we've done is we've gone through a process of looking at people's jobs and determining whether or not we can make that remote and, and can it work and does it work. Then if it does, then we ask people what they want to do. And I think, so me as the head of the agency has, has made a, a statement that I'm really comfortable with everyone having different working arrangements as long as we can find a balance for the individual and the organisation. Now, what that's going to look like in a few years, I've got no idea. Um, but it certainly won't be what we've seen in the last 10 years where people sit at the desk every day and, and then leave and go home. Yeah. And I think that presents some different risks for us. So as organisations and leaders, we need to be able to understand what the risks are, work health and safety risks are, of people working in their own house. And when, they, when are they working and when are they not working in their own house? Um, from a, from a, a psycho, social, psychological perspective, we need to, um, we need to be, sort of have to be clear on what the law requires so you, as, 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 versus what's really good practice. And I think there were some comments in there about the financial wealth management um, so people who are under financial stress do bring those issues into the workplace. Now, from a legislation perspective, um, you probably don't have to consider individual financial risks. But, um, you just have to manage the consequences in the workplace. So I think people, people need to understand what work health and safety risks are presented in the people who do the job in that organisation. And then you need to control those as, uh, as far as reasonably practicable. Um, once you've got those basics in place, then you can build the nice to haves and the extras on there about supporting people through personal crises, um, because it's about having um, happy and productive workers. And, and to make people happy and productive, you might actually go, up, go the extra mile as to not necessarily addressing workplace risks. It's just to help them in the personal life. Mm -hmm. So, um, so these things are probably going to be challenges over the next two to five years. Um, I'll, I've, I've encouraged people in South Australia and more broadly that if, if people are struggling with what this looks like for them and their organisation, is to give us a ring and come and have a chat. So there's a lot of information out there um, around managing psychosocial risks and hazards in the workplace during COVID. If you go onto Safe Work Australia website, um, I think two days ago, they announced a, a, a guidance document on how to do that. Every regulator um, will have information on, on their own website. Um, but if you're stuck, give us a ring. And we've all got advisors who can touch base with you and point you in the right direction as to A, what the law says you have to do, and then B, what's really good practice, gold standard, and some of the sort of resilience programs that are around that can help you on your way. That's brilliant. Thank you for that support. I think um, a lot of people don't really know where to start. Um, and yeah, so if they head to Safe Work SA website, that, that's a great opportunity. And Martin, I really love the fact that you have given staff autonomy and, and, and that one size doesn't fit all. And, and I, in my limited experience in, in this space, that's, I think, one of the biggest things that leaders can do right now, it's a really practical way of saying, what do you need as an employee right now to, for me to help you be at your best? Because when you're having these conversations, you're not just opening up an opportunity to have a great conversation, but you're actually meeting their needs. And that is, you know, a, a pillar of, or a foundation of, of strong wellbeing. And, and I like that approach. And it'll be really interesting to see what happens with the legislation around working from home. Um, that's complex um, and thankfully I don't have to worry about that, but um, it'll be interesting to see um, how businesses move, move forward with that. So I guess from my point of view, what I'm kind of hearing is that there's a, a theme around transition and change and how we can support our staff during change. And uh, I've personally known and seen many organizations who are supporting their staff through change and trying to create more certainty. And I think that Deborah was mentioning around um, communication being a really critical role in creating more certainty. And Deborah, I'm keen to hear what you, th what you think around how the future of camp quality looks. Um, you may not necessarily know this and I've thrown this question to you without kind of giving you any prompts. Um, what, what do you see the future of CQ being like? Um, pretty positive, actually, I would say. Um, what, you know, someone said to me once, never let a good crisis go to waste. And one of the things about uh, COVID has been, a, a it's given us a time to think about 
what are our services and programs and what do they look like in the physical space and what do they look like in the digital space and how do we, you mentioned man, managing people working from home. Um, you know, most people worked in our office previously, now they can come in. So we're very outcome driven. So you can't be saying to people and, you know, check in at nine and, and, and finish at six, but rather say, this is the project, this is the timeline that it needs to be done in. And I think that's a big change for a lot of people as well. There's a lot of trust, but then everything has its pros and cons. So people working at home, sometimes it's difficult for them to turn off. And, you know, I know even with me, I'll, I'll the computer sitting at the end of the dining room table, it's easy for me to get it to finish dinner and then just go down and get back on. And I think one of the things that we're seeing, and, and I try to encourage um, people who um, work for camp quality is to manage their time that you're just because you're working from home doesn't mean you're working 24 seven, you know, you're not working every day. Um, these are the, these are the, the, the things that we need to achieve. And, and I look forward to understanding how you're going to go about that. And back to even what Martin was saying, providing the resources that set people up for success. And that's really important. Often what comes with these kinds of um, challenges are that family, uh, companies have to downsize, that there may be, and we've seen that, that there have been workers made redundant, um, that a lot of the resources that they had before are not available because the company can't afford them. So it's really important, again, to be thinking about your people and that you're able to keep giving them what they need to get their jobs done in the to the best possible standards. And I think coming back to camp quality and watching how the staff have worked, as I say, into new area, in new areas that they weren't necessarily going to be working in. So we might have someone who's used to running a camp is now producing a video. Um, and it's important for us. And what we're doing is to provide courses and upskill our workers. So we're really trying to um, make sure that we look after people and set them up for success. And I think that's really important. Um, and also, as I say, being able to clearly articulate what it is that you want the person, that person to do, what is the project um, and how does it fit within the strategy? Because I'd say everybody listening today has had to adapt their company or their business strategy to fit um, this new way of being. So that's important. I just want to say one thing because I saw a question come up from um, Kaylee, I think it is, about um, anon anonymity in terms of the pulse check. Uh, I just say that we prefer people to give us their names so we can speak to them and get back to them. The anonymous um, comments are, are difficult. We record them. We, we try to sort of work out if it's organizational wide and how we can address them as an organization. But certainly it's better when you get feedback on a pulse check to understand who it's coming from. So you can manage that particular employee's situation. Um, and often I will do that personally with a phone call. And I think that's a beautiful touch that doesn't cost money. And, and I, I, one of the things that I think people sometimes worry about when they're putting together wellbeing frameworks or whatever it is, is that they're worried it's going to cost a lot of money. But in fact, a lot of the stuff is, is free. It's about set, setting good boundaries and connecting and being a human rather than, you know, spending thousands and thousands of dollars on bits and pieces. And, and I've definitely seen that in organisations when you walk into a room and you can see a leader who, who has the respect of their staff and, and that they are present, truly present in the conversations they're having. Um, and they're communicating really effectively. Well, when, when I hear from a staff member about another staff member doing it tough, I will just literally pick up the phone. I think a, a lot of, um, again, a lot of people in organisations that have staff working or reporting into them are finding that a lot of your time is taken up managing staff and that's fine. We just got to get through it. Um, but it's really important because without staff, without staff wellbeing, you don't even have a business, you know, that businesses are run by people for people and we have to look after people first and foremost in order to, um, to be here. <laughs> That's our purpose. Can I, can I just um, give an example of um, what some of our staff did through COVID um, just to make sure that all their employees were safe. Um, our customer service uh, center is in, uh, in Brisbane. We have about um, 100 in customer service and about 100 in customer accounting. Um, we, we, they organised care packages, right? But they didn't get a company to go and deliver the care packages. 
um, the managers deliver the care packages themselves because they wanted to make sure that their staff were safe and they had the right environment to work to operate in when it, when it came to working from home. So they delivered the care packages and they wanted to also make sure that everyone was, was safe during that, that, um, that period. So that's a good example of how you can make sure that, um, you know, you're, you're still directly in touch with your, uh, with your employees. Mm, that's, that's a beautiful example. And, you know, clearly your leaders get it, that it, it needs to be human led when you're trying to build healthy, well teams. Um, it's about that, individual connection that computers and bulk emails just never provide. Um, yeah, thank you, Gary. So there's actually quite a few questions. So um, I might actually get through some of those. Um, the first one's easy, Deborah. Um, what was the name of the Pulse Check um, company you use? It was called Pulse and it's from a company called Local Measure. And uh, I'm not sure... Um, it's just called Pulse and Local Measure. So if you Google that, um, or if a person wants to um, leave a contact, um, I'm happy to get back to them with email and send them through the details. Great. Thank you. I love an easy question. Um, then we have a question um, around an increase of social media harassment and trolling and how does uh, an employer assist with this? And is there much a an employer can actually do? Um, Probably, given you're the exec director of a safety regulator, I wonder if that one's for you, Martin, if you've got any wisdom to share. Yeah, look, uh, it's, um, if, if, if that sort of social media activity is done in the workplace, then, um, then potentially there's a connection there to, to a breach under the Work Health and Safety Act. So, so predominantly for, for us to have jurisdiction, um, that psychological injury has to have occurred in the workplace or related to work. So if, if, as, a, if as a leader in an organisation, you know that people are, are undertaking that activity, then there's an expectation that you address it. And, and no activity is, isn't acceptable either. So, um, so if people are using work-related equipment to harass people through social media, then that's within scope, I would suggest. If people are receiving it in the workplace, potentially that's in scope also. Um, so it really, the, the law comes down to a, a, an organization, an employer has to provide a safe system of work. And, and that's a really broad statement and it's not prescriptive and it's deliberately not prescriptive. It's performance driven. So each organization has to look at themselves as a business and the people in it and understand how you work and what are the risks in relation to doing that work. And then you've got to control them using the hierarchy of controls. So if you can get rid of that risk, then that's the expectation. Or if you can substitute it, engineer it out, etc. Things like training and procedures are administrative controls and they're the lowest form. So whilst we tend to see a lot of that, um, Quite often it's not effective and it's not that good. And an example being is, is when we get complaints of uh, workplace harassment, stress claims, bullying, um, we'll go into an organization and they'll say, look, he, here's my procedure, here's our policy. And, um, and we say, that's fantastic. We'll take that away and read it. But now we're gonna go and talk to your workers. And, th th and this is really easy done. We walk up to people and say, do you have a, a workplace harassment policy? Um, and if they say yes, say, can you tell me what it's about? And the, and the vast majority of workers don't know. Mm. And that's because it's a meaningless document that's written to pacify a regulator. What, what we're looking for, what we expect to see is that bit of paper is good and it, it, and it sets the standard from best practice and what guidelines say we should have. But the expectation is that workers actually understand it, they, they read it, um, that leaders walk the talk, that leaders demonstrate values. And, and this is the sort of thing that we get from investigations. So, so when, we, when we investigate these sort of incidents, um, it's a real particular skill set to investigate them. These things aren't, aren't easy. They're very complex because we're generally dealing with, with injury that you can't see. Um, generally, behavior that's not documented somewhere. It's, it's words, it's behavior, it's actions that result in somebody being hurt psychologically. Um, so trying to prove beyond all reasonable, reasonable doubt that, that these things happened and getting in the court is a real challenge. Um, so, 
So I think from an organization's perspective, um, that board members, leaders, executives, managers, they have a duty to provide a safe system of work under the Work Health and Safety Act. If workplace psychological, psychosocial risks are present, then you have a duty to address them. And you have to ensure as far as reasonably practicable that they are eliminated or, or removed. Um, there are some best practice guidance documents around through Safe Work Australia, um, through individual regulators and through some other industry groups as to what good looks like. Um, and that they're the sort of things that we would expect to, to see. Um, and if those, if those documents and those things that are good aren't present, then I would suggest that you've probably got a gap um, that you need to take some action on. Otherwise, you may find that an organization, you, you're, you're liable. And for senior leaders, um, for executives, and for board members and CEOs, um, we're all individually liable. And you can't insure against this stuff. So we prosecuted people recently um, as an organization for, for workplace bullying. And we've also prosecuted the individuals in that business who did the bullying. And my question to people is, if, if, is, is how much can you afford to pay in a fine before this really impacts your, your life? Um, and this is not even to consider the impact of the victim. This is about you being prosecuted. So could you afford to pay a $20,000 fine or how about a 15,000 or 30 or what if it's 50? Um, so th these are the sort of risks that people didn't think about five to 10 years ago, but these are the risks that are now coming through um, and, and I think the more we look at them and the more people are aware of them, then the more we're going to see in the, in the coming. It's really fascinating. I didn't realise that you couldn't actually insure against that, um, which I think probably would scare a few people on the line. Um, yeah. Look, I mean, legally, it's, it's a crime and you can't insure against committing a crime. Mm. That's really helpful. Thank you for sharing that. And, and I think it kind of it answers two questions, actually. One was our board and senior execs liable, and, and that one came through. And then there was also a question around, you know, how proactive employers should be. Um, and and I, I think proactivity is probably the single most important thing that anyone can do, even if you're not a leader, like actually just talking to colleagues and, and if you see change in behaviour, actually speaking out. Um, yeah. I think that also um, what I've seen and has happened in a number of um, companies that I've worked for is there are very um, good and comprehensive seminars held for employees on social media about not only what they put out themselves, but the rules and regulations and how they can be implicated um, in bullying or worst case, someone harming themselves as a result of the messages that they're uh, receiving. We recently... Uh, signed up to YSAFE um, and they came in and did a, a series of uh, or a presentation to a number of staff and I thought that was really important. It's the same thing in schools, you know, in schools they have this issue um, really, really um, uh, is, a, is a problem and understanding for students to understand that when they sign up to social media channels that there's access to um, that they, they, they own all those photos that all these sorts of things that people don't know and I think that education and education within the workplace is probably a good starting point and something that, uh, that companies need to consider doing more of. I always say with social media don't put anything on social media that you would not run on the front page of the Sydney Morning Herald or the Age. Or the Women's Weekly. Or the Women's Weekly, yeah. That's fantastic. Thanks, Deborah. I've actually, um, we've got a comment from one of our, um, our people at home or wherever they're working from, um, that the Australian Red Cross Life Blood organisation has designed a fantastic um, digital learning um, to help their employees stay safe on social um, channels and avoid trolls. So that's a best practice example of an organisation, a charity as well, who are who were leading that space and realise that maybe they have a risk in, in that they needed to manage. So um, thanks, James, for um, pointing that out. Um, this is another question again for Martin around the hierarchy of controls. Um, to pick up on Martin's hierarchy of control, are we social media... The best control is to come off social media. Okay, I think that's actually a, a comment there rather than a question. But yes, you are correct. It probably is the best. Uh, yeah. Unless unless you're sort of that younger age group, maybe the millennials, and you try and get them off social media, and good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's because it's that's really part of their fabric. Um, so so yeah, don't. But I'd agree with Deborah. Don't put anything on there that you wouldn't want 
Um, yeah, because social media is going to be around. You can't get people off it. It's not, most companies now are using it as their main marketing um, tool and their main connection with, I can say, stakeholders. Um, we did. And it's important um, that you're aware and, and we do regular audits of people who are sending up camp quality pages to make sure that there is nothing on those pages that we need to address. So we monitor those very carefully. And when we see a comment that um, feels that it needs to be moderated, we, we get on and try and do that. And you would see that with the media in general now. You know, uh, there was a case recently, I can't remember, one of the major news organisations was actually sued for a comment by someone. So it's, and I think that comment was on Facebook, but was to do with an article that ran in the paper. So these things are far reaching and really need to be managed from the, the top. And as Martin says, there's got to be procedures, but you've got to make sure that people understand what those policies and procedures are and that they're implemented. And I would say monitored and policed by the organisation. You know, police Definitely. is a strong word, but that's what you have to do if you are ultimately responsible. There's a, um, there was a book released um, a few weeks ago um, by a lady called Genevieve Hawkins. So uh, I've known Genevieve for a few years. She's the, uh, she's the head of Work Health and Safety for Calls Supermarket and a member of the Institute of Health and Safety. But she's written a, a book called Mentally at Work. And it draws a sort of connection or reinforces this connection between a HR approach and psychological illness. So generally, generally sort of psychological illness or uh, mental health issues at work have always sat in HR functions. Mm. Um, but there really needs to be a merging of HR and safety you know, in relation to a, a lot of aspects. Mm. So I think organizations historically have siloed those functions and it's HR or it's the safety department. Um, but really uh, from a, a modern day organization should sort of actually merge those functions to ensure that the safety department are actually sort of facilitating a process where you identify all of those risks and it, wh whatever controls you put in place by the HR team are actually addressing the risks in the first place and a good best practice and, and actually have some benefit. Um, and without that connection, you run the risk of siloed approach where the HR function puts out some training which has no benefit to the actual risk in the first place. Mm -hmm. Tegan, am I allowed to just pick up very briefly on something that Gary said that I thought was really important and it's, um, it resonated with me and that was the word purpose. And Gary talks about providing purpose in a commercial context and I thought that that was, you know, really um, looking at their organisation and what fundamentally do we do about um, for people and we make their lives better and... Um, I think that coming back to, for me, having always worked in the commercial sector and then moving across for the not-for-profit where this purpose is absolutely at the forefront of everything. Uh, we had a day at work where we were all disappointed because we were having to um, cancel events that had been 12 months in the making. And um, obviously not only the disappointment for people, but also um, the loss of revenue. But I went home that night punching the air. And the reason I was punching the air was that we had a, a family who came to us with, and they have a child who's under two with cancer and they were really falling apart and we were able to find respite for them at one of our retreats and get our volunteers to come and work with the family or be with the family to look after the child during the night so the parents could get some sleep. And what that did to our team and the whole team working on that, obviously we looked at all the risks, we sorted them out and we were able to do that for the family and receive incredible feedback and thanks um, for changing a family's life. Just a small thing that we're able to do. And I would say we all went home punching the air and so happy because sense of purpose is, is really what can make human beings just feel on top of the world. And that purpose is, that's our purpose, but everybody can find a different purpose. And I think that particularly in COVID, many of us are now looking for what our purpose is and that ray of light that's ahead. And, and as I say, I'm interested in what Gary said and how they did it in his organisation, but also um, for people outside of their work where they find a purpose through volunteering or helping other people or at the very least stopping and asking someone how they are, having a chat or smiling as they walk past them in the morning. Just adding to that, um, Deborah, is uh, we have all these programs, um, you know, go teach, you know, go green, go help. 
uh, Go Help's an interesting one. It, uh, we've got volunteers within our organisation and they get trained to become uh, a volunteer for uh, what we call a disaster recovery team. So if, we, if there's a natural disaster somewhere in your region, say for here uh, in, in respect to um, Oceania, we can mobilise um, these staff members to go and help. Uh, um, with uh, an earthquake, a tsunami, or whatever. Um, and again, again you, you, we talk about purpose. This is, you know, the staff see this, right? And, and they and they connect, you know, with that with your organisation. They can see that there's a value there, not just you know um, a, a paycheck at the end of the week, but there's there's a real um, purpose of uh, you know why you work for that organisation because they're trying to make it a better place. And I, I can go on with a lot of other programs, but one that's coming up obviously is um, the distribution of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Deutsche Post DHL has a role to play there. So we're saying to all our staff right now, um, uh, when this vaccine is found, um, 10 billion vaccines have to be distributed. Wow. 10 billion, billion, right? I won't tell you how many, you know, freighters that, that, that will require. And, and, and it's all, they've all got to be temperature control between you know, minus 20 and minus 80 degrees. So we've, we've got a enormous role to play and we're telling our staff, right? Um, it's, it's all about humanity and it's all about having this, this real purpose in life as to you know, why, why you do this every day. And we've got a lot of manual jobs and, and quite repetitive jobs but we want them to, to realise that they're, they're having this incredible role to play in making this, this world a better place. I think purpose is so, so important in one's life. That's so great, Gary. And, uh, and the research will back you up on that too, that uh, people who are individually values and purpose-driven tend to have greater sense of well-being. And I think that it, it sounds like the three organisations that are on, on show here today really have demonstrated the power that they can positively impact our environment and our, and our communities. And it doesn't matter whether they're in the private sector like DHL or, or Camp Quality being the not-for-profit or the public sector in Safe Work SA. I think um, it, it demonstrates the power that organisations can bring to actually build mentally healthy people and mentally healthy communities. Um, I'm conscious that we've got three minutes to go, so I'd love just to have a quick uh, whip around from each of the panelists around one tip that each leader could use or take away today to help build mentally healthy teams in their organisations. Um, yeah, I'll throw it to Gary first up. One tip. My, my tip is um, get up every morning at six o'clock and go for a walk with your daughter. <laughs> and that's what I'm doing every day right now. Okay. It, it's a great way to start your, your, your day. That is beautiful. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Deborah. Um, I'm with Gary, but I go with my dog. Um, <laughs> but I would say stop and take the time to talk to people, look people in the eye as you walk past them, smile, and where possible, have a bit of a chat. chat. I think connecting with people is a great way to make you feel good and know that you've helped somebody else um, feel that way as well. Thank you, Deborah. That's lovely. And last but not least, Mr. Campbell. Yeah, for me, it's about caring for our workers. So um, I walk the floor, sit down and talk to people and, 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 and then actually act on what people tell me, irrespective of whether it's work related or personal. Um, and for those guys who maybe want to take away from a, a regulator's perspective is, um, is have a look in your organization and have a look at the risks that are there. And, um, and if you have any doubt as to how to fix them, just give the regulator a ring. And, and have that conversation started off. And, um, and yet yeah, don't be frightened to put some tools in place like Oranges um, to address some of the, the controls. Great, thank you. I, I love the perspective of, of a leader and also as a regulator, I think it can be really helpful for people at home or in their workplaces. Um, speaking of uh, beautiful segue, Martin, for Oranges programs, we've got uh, a huge mental health month planned here for Oranges. We've got a weekly event. The first one's coming up next week, which is leading through a crisis, which is clearly very timely. These are all webinars. Uh, building mentally healthy teams, 
uh, the week after. And then um, the last one is managing burnout and fatigue. Um, and the, the last one is open for anyone, not just necessarily leaders. So if any of those topics are of interest, um, I'll send a follow-up email to um, all of our participants at home um, so that you can, um, yeah, look at, look at those options and see if they fit for you. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to do our usual finishing off, if I can press the right button, um, and thank our panellists for donating their time and so generously giving us um, their wisdom in different sectors. And we were greatly appreciative, Deborah, Gary and Martin, for giving us your time. And, um, and if you are at home and you, and you have a few spare pennies and you're in a position to, we, we'd love to invite you to make a donation to Camp Quality. And as Deborah said, fundraising's been pretty pretty tough during COVID. So um, I'll send a link um, post webinar. So um, thank you all for your time. And uh, yeah, we'll hopefully see you at an event really soon. Uh, thank you, Tegan. And thank you, everybody. Thank who's you. Joined thank us. you, everyone. Bye. Bye now. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Stay safe. Have a great week. Bye.